Next up, we're going to move on to Ross. Ross has worked for a host of clubs during his time and he's worked in a number of different roles. So quite encouragingly, I think he started as a football development manager for Leighton Orient in their community role. Um, and his journey has been where he's been a youth team manager at AFC Bournemouth, a senior development coach at Spurs, and then he moved into senior football where he became the assistant manager at Swindon. Um, he's now been at Orient for three years. Firstly, he was there as the as the assistant coach, and now he fills the role of the head coach. So, with that experience behind him, Ross is going to shed some light on how to manage staff. So, over to you, Ross. Again, appreciate you jumping in at such short notice to do this, mate. It's a privilege to do it. So, um, hopefully, everyone gets as much out of it as I've uh, as I've got in terms of trying to pull it all together. A little bit last minute, but. Um, it's a subject that uh, I think for me, I want, I've been trying to reflect on a little bit during this time. Obviously it's a great time for anybody at the minute to be able to look at sessions and, you know, look at their roles that they do and, and uh, make the most of it and look back on things that they've done particularly well or, or not so well. So it was a subject for me like that. And then the other side of it as well was I think hopefully it would reflect for a number of number of people, whether it's just a partner coach that they work with coaching a coaching a team or whether they have a, you know, a physio or you know, a sports scientist that works alongside them. The, the size of you, excuse me, the size of your structure and staff that you have around you is almost irrelevant. And I think the flip side of that as well is I'm sure a number of people sitting here now will have other jobs that they're, they've got on the side of their coaching or their full-time jobs that is also related to managing people. So hopefully some of the, um, some of the things that I mentioned might cross over. So, um, just to run off sort of a bit of an overview of it, really the, 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 the management of my staff is, it, it, I went through a role this year and I relate a lot of what I talk about, about being an inter, the interim head coach, um, then going back to being the coach or assistant manager, uh, then becoming the interim coach again. And then obviously now, as you touched on there, my role becoming a bit uh, becoming permanent since, since the turn of the year. So obviously all those different um, roles impact the way that you manage people and the relationship that you have with people and the way that you're perceived by uh, the the staff or the personnel that you go to work with every day obviously changes with um, with the with the titles or the you know the particular direction that you're going in as an individual trying to lead those people. Um, there's a little bit on there about the staff structure just so people have got a bit of an idea about what our staff structure looks like um, currently uh, and the roles that fit within that. And then a little bit for me was how did I go about it. Um, when I when I stepped into the role, either interim or or on a permanent basis, how do I do it now? Uh, freedom for people in their job because I think that's incredibly uh, an incredibly big thing for for anybody in any any job is to be able to express yourself. We talk about it with players, we talk about it with your teams, or you know the way you where you set your teams out to play, or the way you want your individuals to go and go and perform when they're when they're playing football. In in this instance. Um, but I think it's massively important for the people that that help pull all of that together, that they have the freedom to shape their roles and, and for them to, you know, to, to progress their roles. Because the one thing that we've got and, and always had since I've been back at Leighton Orient is a workforce that's relatively young. Um, the, the two permanent managers that we had on a more regular basis, Steve Davis from Crewe, um, you know, sort of late 40s, Justin Edinburgh, Obviously, we sadly lost him, but passed away at the age of 49. So a little bit older than the rest of the workforce. So I always felt that having that freedom would help those people develop because ultimately, whether they develop at Leighton Orient or they progress to go on to other opportunities, it's really important that they have that, that freedom to develop their role. Uh, and then the why bit at the end is just a little bit of an overview for me to touch on, on what, what and how I, you know, how I, how I liaise or, or manage, manage the staff sort of directly day to day. Um, so if we can jump on to the next slide. So that, this, is a, this is our staff structure. So the reason I've split it is because the part-time side of it um, can mean that we have sort of five or six other people around the people that are in every day. So obviously I sit, sit on top of that at the moment. Um, there's an assistant, uh, assistant manager and assistant coach, as it's called, at our club. At the start of this season, we had Joby McEnough, who was, our, who was a player coach. So Joby, in the latter part of his career, 38, Still a massive part of the squad, but he was injured. Um, got an eye on what he does when he retires, but he, he fitted into my staff in a bit of a unique role because 
he wasn't really playing and he was suffering quite a, quite a severe injury that's kept him out for most of the season. Uh, but managing him was quite a big big part of, of, of how I sort of got got to grips with a number of different things across the way that I worked with the staff. Uh, we've got a person that leads sports science um, and a lead analysis role that's backed up with somebody that, that fits in in terms of uh, support staff. And then also as well for me, academy staff is such a major part of my development, where I've come from, um, the roles that I've had developing young players, whether that be in a, within an academy system or grassroots. Um, so it's a massive part of me for, for the future of our club that the academy staff are integrated in, in what we're all about. Um, but those part-time roles obviously can link into that as well because we have part-time staff academy-wise that come into the training ground and I think it's important they're integrated the support staff from a sports science and an analysis perspective as well. So, so we can make sure that we're, um, that we're managing everyone and everyone feels part of, of what the club's about. Um, so yeah, so the, the transition period for me was uh, a very difficult one because um, I went into the role as interim head coach at the start of this season. And um, it was about trying to stabilize the club, which is obviously a completely different, completely different uh, focus on, on what I'm talking about at the moment. But it was obviously a very unusual scenario to, for me to be taking over a, a team or a club, first and foremost, without the real desire to be a manager uh, myself, but then at the same time to be doing it in the circumstances after after losing and, and a manager passing away is, is something that you can't really call upon from other people. So the transition was a real strange one now looking back because... At the time, stepping into it, I was comfortable with the fact that I was only going to be the interim manager, whether that be for pre-season, three months, Christmas, the whole season, the next three years, whatever it was going to look like. The interim role didn't bug me because I didn't know I didn't know I wanted to be a manager at that time. Um, so, so it took me a long time to obviously realise that. But the transition made it very uncertain, I'm sure, for, for the staff in terms of who their leader was. So they would come in every day and they had me, someone that was very, very familiar with them and probably leads into this managing peers bit a little bit as I'll come on to. But somebody was leading these people every day, but actually there was no definition to um, whether or not I was going to be in that role for the longer term. So I think for them, looking at me, taking information on, uh, wondering what exactly what direction we were going in um, would have been very, very difficult, uh, difficult for them. And I think at the same time, me stepping into that, stepping into a in, into a role that I've never really experienced before. Um, my selfish um, focus was on me, and then how I was going to go and set the team up. Um, and I never really had, if I'm brutally honest, I never really had an idea on what the staff needed, uh, what direction they needed to be taken in, what what sort of information they needed every day in order to help them to do their jobs in the way that I wanted to. I had no, no real real, real focus or, or viewpoint on that. And then leading on to the, the, the managing peers, peers bit, really, um, they were my mates, some of them. They were, um, sorry, can we just nudge that back a little bit? They were my mates. They were people that, were, um, that I'd gone to work with every day and... Uh, had a laugh and a joke we've had a different relationship than 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 being their manager than being their leader so um, it was very very unusual to all of a sudden be sat in front of them and them looking for me to really direct them because in the, in the previous two years there'd always always been someone above me or at least two people because we have a director of football at our club that that would would lead the staff in the direction that the club wanted them to go in or the manager would lead them in the direction of how they wanted them to work or wanted the players to work and what, the, what they wanted the players to see every day. So it was a very strange feeling and an unusual um, responsibility to have your mates or the people that you, you built those sorts of relationships looking at you waiting for leadership. So obviously I discussed it with a lot of people that were, that were close or people that had been in, in that environment or in that, that situation um, and tried to get some guidance and advice on on what the best ways of going about it were and in the original in the outset what I got back from a lot of people was a lot of words and I mean that in the nicest possible way because people were desperately trying to help me trying to give me the advice that was really going to help and I've got a lot of things of be yourself uh, don't try and be somebody else be honest with people which I think is something that 
is something I've definitely taken on. But um, then I've got what's your management style? Um, you know, how do you want people to to perceive you every day? You know, a lot of it felt to me like it was um, it was uh words that were just being thrown out there you know buzzwords information that wasn't really giving me much else so i sort of started to try and take the standpoint of i'm just going to try and be me as much as i possibly can and, and and shape everybody and try and lead everybody towards what i am the type of environment that i want every day um and now i think that's going to make it the best environment possible for the players that you know that are ultimately going out on the pitch to um to deliver what you want every week so um that was something that, that that I found really, really difficult because I was trying to seek support, um, but at the same time, what was coming back at me, albeit it was it, it was people trying to help, it was it was sort of em- empty words for the want of a better phrase because people were really trying to uh, trying to help, but but it was a lot of sort of words and cliches that, that that couldn't quite help me through it at times. I think delegation was one that really always stuck out at me. Um, and I knew that I needed to share some responsibility. I'd always led the training ground and been the person that people made contact with or the first person that, that they came to when, when something needed organising at the training ground. And all of a sudden, I needed that little bit of distance and that little bit of time to myself. Um, so really trying to delegate. But my form of delegate was try and tell someone to come with it and then wait and see or, or leave, them, leave them to it. Very rarely did I support them or um, have any real handover to to show them exactly what it looked like or what I wanted it to look like. So I felt then that looking back now that I was, I was sending uh, members of staff and, and people into um, situations that they had, they had no experience and, and, and certainly no uh, direction and, and, and end goal as to how that, that was all going to look and, and certainly what, what I wanted it to look like. Um, but I think as, as the roles obviously change, as I touched on right at the beginning, as the roles started to change, I think once things became a little bit more permanent, once the decisions were made for me to become the permanent manager, I think it then allowed people to approach me in a different man- manner to start to um, find out, to start to seek, and then obviously ultimately for me to try to lead them into uh, into the direction that I wanted them to go on. Um, can we just jump on to the, I don't know if it's the next slide. Um, so it might have been the one previous to that. I might have just jumped that one out. No, go and jump back to that one. All right, sorry, my bad. Um, yeah, so I think um, expectations were things that first started to um, to set, and I think expectation and and the, and the freedom that will lead on to that a little bit was it was my realization of what I wanted from my team in terms of the players, how hard I wanted them to work, started to give us a bit of an idea so that the the analysis boys knew every week what it was they were really clawing out of of the game, what they needed to to bring out of our performances for the good, the bad, or the indifferent, so that we could feed that they could feed that back to me, or I could feed that back to them, and then ultimately we could share that with the players. And then how hard I wanted them to work, and it was touched on at the beginning around distances. I think Ian Everett asked asked the question on the on the first presentation about distances and is there an expectation I'm not really talking about hard work on that um, perspective I'm, I'm, I'm talking about how I wanted them to work you know the type of um, sessions we wanted them to do every day uh, when would we put a, an analysis session in when did we want the video prepared for all things that um, I took for granted um, that weren't set in stone weren't set in place for people to be able to follow so I think we started to structure the week Simple things like a meeting on a Monday morning, um, early you know early morning meeting before before players were in to outline what we wanted the week to look like, and what that did that evolved and changed. If we have a Saturday to Saturday or a Saturday to Tuesday, I think a Saturday Tuesday. I apologise. I think if we ever have a midweek game, we tend to have more meetings, whether that be just the staff or we involve the players in that. But we started to get a little bit more of a structure to the week now. So, so now when we have a Saturday to Saturday game, all the staff know that we meet on a Monday morning. Um, we obviously don't meet on the day of the, day of the game, but we would meet the, the morning after uh, because we're still on a, in, in, in our, our uh, working week works Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, off Thursday and train on a Friday again. So um, we, would, we would have a meeting on all four days because so much can evolve and so much can change, whether it's related to 
the intensity that the players are working at, whether it's the injuries and a report process from the medical department. Um, and again, obviously, that has a real major impact on, on how training looks and, 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 and how we deliver that. Um, and then what we started to then evolve was a heads of department. Now, we're a small workforce. Um, we're blessed with the amount of uh, staff that we already have that, that I touched on at the beginning. Um, but if you compare that to some of, the, some of the big clubs across the country, it's obviously very small departments. But what I tried to then pull together was a little bit of leadership for the, the, the first team staff. So the head of analysis at first team level would directly meet and cross over uh, every week or certainly every 10 days with um, any of the support staff that came in in that department. Then also the academy to integrate them so that there was a real theme across the way that we work and an understanding of everybody. So that when something simple as a, an under-18 player coming up, coming over to train with a first team, that they understand what the expectations are. And the more people that have an understanding of what goes on at the first team level, that makes that transition a little bit smoother. Same from a sports science perspective. The people that work every day with the youth team players would meet with a head of, head of performance with, with the first team um, to help them get that uniform across the club. But also at the same time to to give those heads of department that little bit more responsibility, help them evolve, help them progress in their own, uh, their own development and their own careers. Because I think it's, 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 it's massive for them to have a little bit of responsibility and be that little bit more of a senior person in those meetings and, and start to sort of take uh, other members of staff in a certain direction is, um, is really important for their development as well. And then to create an interest and a knowledge uh, and then hopefully, hopefully overall uh, develop everything that goes on across the club we encourage uh, an interaction in 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 in, in across departments um, not something that we do on a week week to week basis i think that would probably look more on a on a once a month every once every couple of weeks type a little bit more relaxed but there's a, a crossover of people sharing interests sharing knowledge and and something that's come out on on, on this level uh, since this this break that we've been through is for us to share and gather more interest and more knowledge in what goes on at the top. Uh, I've found that me and all the staff that, that analyse our games or opposition games spend so much time watching Macclesfield against Mansfield or Plymouth against Swindon, which are all valuable, invaluable games for us to watch in terms of preparation and get into grips with the level of football that we're currently at. But at the same time, we don't do it enough with the top, with the very best. So now things have settled down and, and we, you know, we're getting into it further and further into this period without, without being directly at work. I think it's something that we've all started to, um, to share across departments is um, the different things and the, and the things that people are doing at the very, very top in order to make us aspire to be more, to develop our players to be more, whether that be the young players or the more senior pros. Um, and ultimately make us all all better at what we do, um, evolving around around what goes on at the very very top, and not just at at le at, le at the League Two level. Um, and obviously, the sharing and understanding of that in each area is vital. You know, from a physical perspective and sports science analysis, and then what happens you know day to day from a on a technical perspective, uh, and how that will affect us tactically, which is which is certainly it's going to have its uh, a major impact on. Um, on what we do when we when we return and, and hopefully ov overall make us better at what we do. Um, and I think the, 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 the last two things that I'd, that I'd really touch on is the why section of, of, of what's up on the current slide now is, is, is where I am now in terms of how I deal with the staff. Um, the freedom is there for them to shape their departments, to evolve their departments, for them to take that in a different direction or a new direction that's going to, you know, going to change and evolve the way our club has worked over the last few years. But always, I just want to know why. Um, why are we doing it? Is it going to make us any better? Is it going to make the individuals within that department better? And in the longer run, is it going to make the players and the team better at what we do? So the why question is something that I think just pretty much finishes off most meetings that we have every day that really gives us... Um, the opportunity for people to feedback and for me to continue to keep getting better and, and expanding my own knowledge on how each department works and, and, and listening to the people with the real overall expertise. There was one other thing, sorry, that, that I know I've gone over time, but 
just to touch upon was um, on one of the slides there, I mentioned about a central area. Um, like most people at our level, a central place, sorry. Um, at most people, like most clubs at our level, you know, we're blessed in terms of the training ground that we've got. It's not huge in terms of the space that, that we've got. We've got a couple of pitches and a, and a, you know, a, a building that complements the level of football that we play at every week. But we try to make the best of the space that we've got. You know, there's a lot of people based in their day-to-day -day across the, the first team and the academy. But we always have a central place for all the staff to meet in. Everybody eats, eats lunch together. So you know, whether it's been me caught up with players, whether it's somebody doing some analysis work, whether the sports scientist is working in the gym, we always make sure that we meet in that central place once that work's done and the whole staff, the whole workforce all sit down and, and, and eat together because I think it's a massive, it's a simple thing but it's an incredibly huge thing for people to sit down and then relax and talk about life and talk about normal day-to-day -day things about families, about, um, you know, what they did the night before, what they did at the weekend, as you can imagine, different stories come out of that at different times. Um, but I think it's so important in order to create that camaraderie that it's not all just about work. It's not all just about getting better. It's not all just about what we're going to do to, to help the players and what tactics we're going to use for the weekend. It's about how best, um, we can create an environment that everybody wants to come and work in every day. And I think the minute you, you get that, the minute you get that feel and that, that environment to, uh, to the way that you work every day, you're, in a, you're, in, you're going to be in a very, very good and very, very strong place in order to, uh, in order to do all the other bits that, you know, that we're all talking about this evening, I suppose. Nice one, Ross, mate. You've got, um, you've got a, a lot of really good questions, but we are sort of running a little bit behind. So I'm going to ask just one that I think might cover uh, a couple of them, to be fair. But I don't know whether it means in terms of a sense of a, a player or, or, a, or a coach, a, a member of the coaching staff, but how do you deal with big personalities? Um, I said it in there when I was talking. I think honesty is is a simple uh, it's a simple term simple word but it's the it's the the most simple thing to go back to and i think it was the biggest eye opener for me in terms of being in the role that i'm in now was how was i going to how was i going to deal with people that i built incredibly close relationships with as the first team coach because ultimately you have a different relationship with your players but then secondly, how was I going to deal with the ones that are perceived as being fans' favourites that won the league last year, that I was at some stage going to have to rock the boat and, and drop people or leave people out and have those difficult conversations? And I think the one thing that you can only be is honest with people. If that means telling them straight exactly what you think at that time, I can tell you now that they're not going to agree with you. Uh, and there's going to be a backlash with, with one or two because um, different people react in different ways. Um, you know, footballers, first and foremost, look out for themselves, like, you know, like a lot of us do. But it's, it, footballers look out for themselves in their own careers and they want to be in the team every week. But I think if you're straight and if you're honest with people, even if they deal with it or they don't like, uh, even if they disagree and they don't like the information that they're receiving, if you're straight and you're telling them the truth, and tell them exactly what you think. Ultimately, they can't argue. They will do, and they'll knock on the door the next day if you've got your decision wrong, uh, and they'll question <laughs> you again. But ultimately, again, if it comes back to it, that's exactly what I think. You're not pulling the wool over their eyes. You're not trying to be something else. You're trying to just be totally straight and honest. I think that's all you can ever be. Um, yeah. You'll make mistakes. You'll get it wrong. You'll get it right. Uh, and you'll, and you'll um, experience different different reactions, which, are, which I have in, in abundance in in recent times, but it's, um, but I think for me, it's the only way to go about it. So as simplistic as it sounds, I think it's the first approach, first and foremost, that's going to allow you anything else to build upon. No, that's brilliant, mate. Um, thank you for that. 